Sean, you can go ahead and introduce yourself and then we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Sean Tilson. I was a graduate student at Wayne State uh, and I worked with Bob and Dan and now I live in Germany. I like thinking about uh, infinity algebra structures and sort of computational consequences and I like to try and do computations. Um, so I should go ahead and start. Is that, yeah? All right. So, uh, so my talk is about squaring operations in a C2 equivariant and motivic atom spectral sequences. Uh, these are potentially ambiguous things, but I'll clarify what I mean by them. Um, also, please uh, slow me down or ask questions. Uh, I'm happy to do that. So uh, we want to talk about scoring operations. So what do we need to define power operations in general? Uh, last week, Tyler, or sorry, two weeks ago, Tyler talked about this. Uh, we start with an element in homology. We can represent it by a map from a sphere in. John, um, did you want to yeah. share a, your screen? Did I not do that? I thought not I hit yet. that button. Yo, know, I, I began to hit it, but I didn't finish. Is that better? Yeah, we can see your screen now. All right, thanks. Here was the first title slide. Uh, so yeah, so for defining power operations, we'll start with a homology class. Uh, we also need a structure map for our homology theory, E, and we need a structure map for X. So if E and X are both E infinity algebras or H infinity algebras, we'll have such a thing. And then we need a guy alpha, and this is going to sort of be the label for our operation. And it lives in the homology of these extended powers. And these are going to give us operations that I write as Q lower alpha. Uh, so how do we get these? So we start with our map X. And we're going to take the extended power of X, since that's a functor, and smash it with E on either side. We're going to use those structure maps that we had before for E and X. Um, if you have two E infinity algebras, their smash product is an E infinity algebra. So you, you get such a map. And then we're going to post compose with multiplication on E and pre compose with this guy alpha that I said was sort of like the label for the operation. And the composite is going to be the power operation on X. So that's how we have power operations generally. And we're going to try and apply this to filtered spectra in order to get power operations in spectral sequences. So uh, we're going to replace the representing objects, the spheres, by filtered spectra, these URSKs. These are universal examples, uh, which we'll get to later. We're going to replace things like mu, the product on E, and xi, the E infinity structure map, with uh, sort of filtered versions. And then we need to uh, compute sort of the analogs of alpha, which involve looking at maps from universal examples into sort of filtered extended powers of universal examples. So this is like the general outline of how we replace each stage where we had power operations with something filtered. Um, but I mean, I haven't defined any of this stuff. Uh, so we're going to define all of that. And there are a couple of further ingredients or moving parts to the kind of result but let's first see what the result is. So in the ROC2 atom spectral sequence or the real motivic atom spectral sequence, if you have a permanent cycle in X, since we're working equivariantly or motivically, this is trigraded. So I have a class in X over the appropriate dual Steenrod algebra with coefficients in M2. M2 is just the cohomology of a point. So this is the analog of F2. Uh, then we have D2 of square I minus one of X is equal to alpha sub iq of square i of x, where these alphas are these coefficients depending on the parity of i and q, and they all live in x one one zero. Uh, so there are a couple things you could mean by a equivariant or motivic atom spectral sequence. I mean specifically the one constructed by Huing Kriege and Duggar and Isaacson, respectively. Uh, so in particular, these are things that converge to bigraded homotopy groups 
and I'm not computing X in Mackie functors or in some category of sheaves. Okay, so I mentioned the moving parts are ingredients. So there's a algebraic condition, which ensures that the E2 page has operations that are well behaved. So this is a, sort of a basic computation that follows from some projectivity of the dual Steenrad algebra over the coefficients. This isn't completely formal, but uh, in the cases that you encounter, someone's probably already done the relevant computation. Oh, sorry. So the point of this slide is to explain what the moving parts are in case you have some other spectral sequence and you want to see if there's a way of proving a similar theorem there. Um, all right, so there's something I call the homotopical condition, which ensures that there is an H infinity structure on the atoms filtration, uh, which we'll get to a definition of. So this uses obstruction theory and some universal coefficient spectral sequences. Um, so this was less formal than I thought it was initially. Um, then there's a geometric condition. So we have power operations on the E2 page and we have some sort of H infinity structure on the filtration, but a priori, you don't know that they're related. Uh, the geometric condition ensures that they're related. And um, it's also helpful in, in showing that there is an H infinity structure. Uh, this is the most formal of all of these ingredients and it's pretty model categorical as we'll see. The last bit is the computation of some attaching maps. This is gonna tell us the alpha IQs. This is the least formal and the most computational. Uh, so I, I mentioned there are some parts that are special to C2. This is mostly in uh, the universal coefficient spectral sequence uh, bit. So the plan for the talk is to talk about filtered spectra. It's pretty categorical. Um, then to talk about background on equivariant and motivic homotopy theory, this is gonna be kind of brief and this is just gonna kind of be a list of facts that we need. Uh, then I wanna talk about the algebraic and geometric conditions. I'm gonna talk about the H infinity structure on the atoms filtration, and then we're gonna prove the theorem. And uh, hopefully if we have time, we'll be able to talk about some examples. So definition. A filtered spectrum is just a diagram of spectra uh, indexed over the integers, and I want each map to be a cofibration. And we're going to refer to E0 of X bullet. So, so if I write something with a bullet, that means it's a filtered object. So E0 of such a thing is given by the associated graded complex of the filtration, and that circle through the arrow just means that the map isn't quite to what it says it is, but to a suspension of it. I stole this trick from, uh, from Dan Christensen and Martin Franklin. Um, so the atoms filtration is going to be constant on the positive, or the, sorry, on the non-negative integers. So the atoms filtration is always going to be in negative degrees. We'll see that come up a bit later. Um, so these filtered spectra, they have a symmetric monoidal structure, and we can talk about H infinity structures as well. So the smash product of two filtered spectra is given by this co-limit. Um, in degree n, you can think of this as uh, sort of a union over the smaller parts if these were cell complexes. This is the same as the day convolution product of two functors out of the integers. Uh, you could similarly generalize this to R-fold smash products uh, in the obvious way. Uh, multiplicative filtration is just an algebra uh, up to homotopy for, for this. For, for gamma. When uh, an important fact about this is that if the filtration is level wise free, then the associated graded of the smash product of two filtrations is just the graded tensor product of the associated gradeds. So this is sort of very much like what happens in chain complexes. And level wise free just means that the cofibers are a free module. This is gonna be the case for the atoms filtration. And this fact is kind of a motivating feature of, of this smash product. An H infinity structure on a filtration is a collection of structure maps. So I have a gamma with a tilde over it and an R. So that's where I smash together a filtration of E sigma R and uh, 
gamma r of x. So I'm going to smash x with itself r times. I'm going to smash that with e sigma r. And I'm going to take the orbits of that. And I need one of these for every r. And they need to satisfy um, suitable coherences that you expect in general from extended powers. When x is uh, level-wise free, if I take E0, this just looks like the cellular chains on E sigma R tensored with the Rth power of the associated gradient of X. There's another typo, sorry about that. Um, so this should be E0 of X bullet there. And this structure is going to, and we're, we'll talk about this in a bit, but these theta R's are gonna induce the Steenrod operations on the E2 page. So I should say something about what I mean by uh, E sigma R. So we're talking about equivariant and motivic things. So it's not just enough to mention a space. I have to give you, for example, a C2 action on that space. We're going to use in particular the co-limit of these SN comma zero. So this means that there is no uh, C2 action. The C2 action is trivial. And I'm just gonna take the union of all of these for E sigma two in the motivic setting. This is corresponds to just taking simplicial spheres. Another choice is you could take these S2NNs and these would give you different algebraic operations. This would just change what the, what the grading is here. So this, the chains on E sigma R would sort of have a different by degree and these operations, these theta Rs would change the by degree in a different way. So our choice here is motivated by it has to, the fact that it has to match what happens on the E2 page. Uh, the E2 page, so in, in ROC2 graded homotopy, rings aren't graded commutative, they're epsilon commutative. But for modules over island berg maclean spectra, epsilon is just the same as one. So we don't see anything new or interesting. So basically, if I go and I compute X for the E2 page of the equivariant atom spectral sequence, I have this extra grading, but it doesn't have any sort of extra symmetry that I see. If it had extra symmetry, maybe we'd make a different choice, but this extra grading just sort of comes along for free. Um, but this may be related to the fact that we're computing X of sheaves, uh, uh, sorry, that we're just computing X of modules as opposed to of sheaves or of Mackie functors. If you wanted to look at some of the, NF, what the N infinity structure would do, that, that ought to give you something a, a different family of, of formulas for differentials. Is that, does that make, well, I'll continue until someone interrupts me. All right, so I mentioned these universal examples. These were first introduced in the case of, uh, I think, simplicial or co-simplicial chain complexes by Bousfield and Kahn. So for me, a filtered spectrum is one of these URSPQ guys. So PQ ought to be the same as N here. So R is going to tell me sort of how long a differential I have, and S is going to tell me what filtration I start in. So you have a point for a certain amount of time, and then you have just a sphere, dimension n minus 1. So that should be p minus 1 comma q. And you're going to take the identity map a bunch mm -hmm. until you get to the S filtration, and then you should include uh, the sphere into the cone on that sphere or into the disk. Now, the cool thing about this is the associated filter, uh, spectral sequence to this filtered spectrum. Well, here's the E1 page. You just have a point everywhere, except in two spots, you've got an SN and an SN minus one. And so there's only one non-trivial differential. And that happens, it's exactly length R. So that's what the R corresponds to, is how long of a differential there is in this spectral sequence. The S tells you what differential the class is in, and this PQ is supposed to be the geometric dimension of uh, the geometric degree of, of the class. So when R is infinity, we're just, so we're going to have a point. Dan, yeah, sorry, this is Dan Isaacson. Did yeah. I hear you say that, 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 there's, that N is the same as P comma Q? Yeah, n is supposed to be p comma q. So, okay. so n should be. So instead of n minus one, it should be p minus one comma q. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so, so basically, the thing is, you just take what sphere of whatever dimension you want, and you just include it into the cone. Okay. 
Um, so when R is infinity, we're just going to have a point, and then with the identity map, we're going to include that into the sphere, and then we're going to take the identity map on the sphere. And this is going to be important for us because we're going to be looking at permanent cycles. So if I have a class and it has a differential on it in a spectral sequence, there's a map of filtered spectra from one of these universal examples to the filtration. And X is going to be in filtration S sub X and total degree N sub X. And this, for example, we're going to see how this can be used to show that a multiplicative filtration has an associated multiplicative spectral sequence. So suppose that the filtration Y is multiplicative and we want to compute the differential on X1 times X2. So we're gonna represent both of these classes by maps of universal examples. Uh, so then we have the composite, right? I can smash these two universal examples together and uh, this functor, so gamma is a functor, so I get a map from the smash product of the two universal examples to Y smash with itself, and then I can post compose with the product, the multiplicative structure of Y. So now any differentials I have here are gonna push forward to differentials in the spectral sequence for Y. So we just need to compute the differentials in this spectral sequence. Uh, but these universal examples are level wise free. So we have this nice fact that I mentioned. And the spectral sequence of the universal example of this smash product of two universal examples looks like, like this. So we've got this length R uh, thing here where nothing really changes and then something length R here where nothing really changes. And over here on this DN, um, this is going to hit inside the sp spectral sequence for Y under that post composition under mu bullet is going to hit X1 times X2. And this guy is going to hit exactly a DR of X1 times X2 plus some sine times X1 DR of X2. So if you look at how uh, the cells include here, you get exactly the Leibniz formula. And the sign even comes out from how you have to move various factors of the sphere past each other. So we're gonna do something like this, but with power operations. So when Y has an H infinity structure, we're gonna get power operations on X by representing X, applying this extended power construction to it, post-composing with the structure map, and then pre-composing with maps from universal examples in. So essentially computing these, uh, the differentials in this spectral sequence. And this is, uh, this is like the fourth part, uh, the fourth ingredient that I mentioned. So, so this kind of thing here is like, like that alpha in that Q alpha, that's like the label part. So, when X is a permanent cycle, we still get interesting information. And this is because when you apply this filtered extended power to that kind of universal example, you get these truncated equivariant projective spaces. Um, I'm going to define this in a bit. What's next? Okay, so stuff on uh, background on, so this is my first Beamer talk, so it seems like the the sections aren't showing up or I'm not viewing it in the right way. Anyway, all right. So background on equivariant and motivic stuff. We're only gonna work with cellular objects. So rep C2 complexes are built from representations. So like one point compactifications of representations, unit spheres of representations and unit disks of representations. C2 CW complexes are built from orbits. So things like G mod H cross DN. Um, so SPQ is gonna be the notation for P minus Q trivial representations, direct sum with Q sign representations, one point compactified. The ROG grading or ROC2 grading on homotopy groups is induced by maps out of these representation spheres. The Mackey functor structure is induced by maps out of uh, these orbits. Now, in general, these two classes, these REPC2 complexes and C2CW complexes, they differ in general. But in the case of C2, they're the same. So, uh, you have that these two classes stably coincide. And the proof of that is just to consider this cofiber sequence where I have C2 with a disjoint base point uh, mapping to the zero sphere and the cofiber is this S11. And if you look at things that can be built out of these guys, the two guys on the left are both 
uh, sort of orbits that you could build things out of, and the two guys on the right are representation spheres you could build things out of. So the third thing is stably in the class of the other, just by rotation of a triangle. So stably weak equivalences between cellular objects are detected by isomorphisms in ROC2 graded homotopy. Uh, this follows from the above. Uh, and um, usually the weak equivalences are things that induce isomorphisms of Mackey functors in the integer graded homotopy groups. But we're actually going to need that these determine weak equivalences later on for constructing the H infinity structure. Um, in the motivic setting, this last fact also holds a sort of a definition of cellularity almost. So uh, the, this base ring that we're going to work over uh, is the homotopy groups of this equivariant eilenberg maclean spectrum for the constant Mackey functor F2. Its homotopy is M2, is polynomial on two guys plus this negative cone bit. It's got this theta here that's infinitely rho and tau divisible. It is also rho and tau torsion. So if you saw Dan Duggar's talk, this thing contributed the negative cone. And these are the bi-degrees of the classes. The equivariant dual Steenrad algebra uh, was also computed by Hugh and Kriege, and it is free over its coefficients. The motivic versions of these results are due to Voivodsky, and the only difference is that there's, there's not this class theta. Now, a, a crucial functor for us is going to be Betty realization. So this associates to every motivic stable homotopy type and equivariant stable homotopy type. It's induced by taking a variety to the complex points with the Galois action. So if I have a variety over the reals, I can pull it back to the complex numbers and then it gets a C2 action. And then I can take that variety with the complex topology. Now I can con extend this to get something on all motivic spaces and then you stabilize to get a stable functor. The Betty realization of the bi-graded motivic spheres is exactly the bi-graded equivariant spheres. Uh, Heller and Ormsby showed that this functor is in fact a left quillen and strong symmetric monoidal. So this is going to imply that this Betty realization commutes with our, our sort of filtered extended power construction, which is gonna be really important when we try to work motivically. Another theorem of Heller, or this also follows from work of Heller and Ormsby, that Betty realization in fact induces an isomorphism on the stable zero stems. So the fact that Betty realization is going to play nice, sorry, that should be cofiber sequences, is going to allow us to compute the attaching maps of these extended powers of these universal examples in the motivic setting. Uh, Heller and Ormsby also showed, oh, that's weird spacing, sorry. Uh, that if I take the Betty realization of a motivic eilenberg maclean spectrum, I get an equivariant eilenberg maclean spectrum. And Hoi showed that these were cellular. Right, so these equivariant projective spaces. So RP, PQ is the space of lines in RP plus one comma Q. As C2 spaces, this is in fact equal to uh, this other guy with the other index. And you see this just by letting C2 act on sort of the first several homogeneous coordinates or the last several homogeneous coordinates. And since they're all homogeneous, it doesn't matter if you pick sort of the last chunk or the first chunk. The underlying space of these things is, is obvious. And then the fixed points, is just a disjoint union of smaller projective spaces. Um, we also have that the equivariant uh, zero stem is, Z2 and it's generated by one and epsilon. And so this U is the underlying map of something and F is what happens on fixed points. Sean, this is and, Dan Isaacson. When you say, yeah. when you're using F and this fixed points, you mean like the genuine fixed points, not the geometric fixed points, right? So uh, I mean categorical fixed points since I'm talking about spaces here, but yeah. we're going to compute things stably. So in that setting, I do mean geometric fixed points. But since I'm talking about maps between suspension spectra stably, that's the same as you can compute those just by looking what it is on the <coughs> unstable homotopy type. But, but it's also the case that you can change the model structure equivariantly so that weak equivalences are detected by things 
by, by, by geometric fixed points. Does that uh, address your question? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so we need the attaching maps of these spaces. These are gonna give us the coefficients alpha IQ, uh, not identically, but, but yeah. Okay, so the projections of these attaching maps, so the contribution to the zero stem uh, just depends on the parity of I and J. And uh, you compute this by just trying to compute what element of the zero stem is by looking at what it does, what the, what the map induces on geometric fixed points and on the underlying thing. Okay. So why, is, why are these projective spaces relevant? Well, classically, if I take the extended power of the sphere, so this parentheses upper K here, should mean that I take a K skeleton of EC2. So I should have written that. And that's another typo. That should, oh, that's fine. Sorry. So, um, so if I take the K skeleton of EC2 and I smash it over, sorry, of E sigma 2 and I smash it over sigma 2 with SN, smash with itself, I get the suspension of this truncated projective space. And the same thing happens equivariantly. There is no motivic analog of this that I know of because the proof is pretty geometric. So we're gonna use Betty realization to get around on this. All right, so if I take this uh, sort of this, so this TR here means that I'm talking with uh, the model for E sigma two that I mentioned before. So if I apply that to a bi-graded sphere, we get these sort of same attaching maps. And this follows from Heller and Ormsby, as I mentioned. All right. So now we need to talk about uh, the algebraic and the geometric condition. Um, so May developed machinery for talking about algebraic Steenrod operations, and Bruner also worked with these, his work on the atom spectral sequence. So if I have a co-commutative hop algebra over F2, there are natural operations, these square I, and they satisfy the Cartan formula, dem relations, and instability. When, and this happens when M is a commutative A algebra in co-modules, and N is a co-commutative A co-algebra in co-modules. And we can apply this directly to our situation. But let's first see sort of where these operations come from. So there's kind of an extended power construction in chain complexes. Uh, May showed that uh, if you have a chain complex, then the homology of that chain complex has algebraic Steenrod operations when there is a map from chains on E sigma two tensored over sigma two with K squared back to K. Uh, and they restrict to the ordinary product on E zero. So E zero here is just the bottom part of chains on E sigma two. So we can define these operations as looking at uh, this map theta applied to a particular guy in the chain complex uh, and chains on E sigma two tensored with X with itself. So now if I, if I, take the top operation, I'm just gonna get X squared back because I had this assumption that on E zero restricts to the product. And EI is just the generator of the I piece. So there are further conditions to ensure that the operation satisfy Cartan formula and DEM relations, um, but we, we don't need to worry about that. The important facts about these operations are that they're natural, they're well-behaved, they're relative, they're, they're computable relatively. I think if Bob were here, you'd hear him laughing in the background right now. Um, but so they're partly computable because we have Cartan formula and dime relations. Uh, the, the main function is a sort of name elements. Um, but again, like just like with multiplicative uh, spectral sequences, if you have a product on something and you have a product on the spectral sequence and on the filtration, you don't know that they're related a priori. So we have these operations on the E2 page just by directly applying Bruner's result, but maybe they don't have anything to do with the filtration. 
so to get to deal with that, we have this geometric condition. And this is pretty formal. So Z sub K S is just going to denote this guy. So I'm going to take the Fth stage of the R fold smash power. And I'm going to smash it with the K piece of the filtration on E sigma R. And I'm going to take the orbits with respect to the sigma R action. So we're going to say that a uh, extended power construction satisfies the geometric condition if for a, a filtration we have these three conditions. So I can look at these two relative guys and they should be relative cell pairs. So they should be co-fibrations. Um, then the quotient should look like this. And the last condition was I, I tried displaying it even on a slide by itself and it didn't fit. Um, but uh, I don't think we'll lose any sleep over it. So um, this is the geometric condition. Uh, and it's a fact, it's not hard to show that this extended power construction with the trivial structure satisfies the geometric condition in both the equivariant and the motivic settings. Essentially, you just have to look at how cofiber sequences interact with smash products. A corollary of that is that if you have an H infinity filtration and the geometric condition, then the homology of the E0 page has algebraic operations in the sense of May. And they satisfy the Cartan formula and the ADEM relations. The Cartan formula and the ADEM relations are related to these coherences I didn't specify in the H infinity structure. All right, so now the algebraic operations and the H infinity structure are related. Um, that's great. We also, however, will use the geometric condition in our inductive construction of the H infinity structure. And this is, I don't want to spend too much time on that. It's a bit complicated, uh, but I'll outline it. All right, so we have the canonical HF2 atoms filtration. It's given where well, you start with Y and you're going to smash Remember our atoms filtration is all in negative degrees. So y minus one is going to be y minus one is going to be y zero smash the fiber of the unit on HF2. And the structure maps are just induced by including the fiber into the sphere. Important features of this is that the quotients are retracts of these sort of extended co-modules, or of they're sort of free modules in a sense. And and that the induced maps and homologies are split monomorphisms. Uh, it's obvious how to modify this for the motivic setting. So the atoms filtration has an H infinity structure and we prove this using obstruction theory. It's a relatively standard inductive construction where you work one cell at a time. So we want to construct a map from this ZKS to YS plus K such that this diagram commutes, right? So we wanna construct this long dotted diagonal map here, such that when we restrict it to these various parts, it, it coincides with what we already know. Um, I just wanna point out that this, the, the cells of the E sigma R are in positive filtration. And what this will end up doing for us is that if you increase the filtration enough because the atoms filtration is negative and this is in the positive degree, then eventually you will just be, if, if K is large enough, this just maps back, this just involves the H infinity structure on Y. So you're not gonna have an H infinity structure on a filtration unless Y is an H infinity algebra. I should have mentioned that, sorry. Okay, so by work of Christensen, Dwyer, and Isaacson, the obstruction, to this long diagonal guy is gonna live in a map between the cofibers. Okay, there's a natural isomorphism between maps from X into such an extended guy and, uh, and just looking at maps in homology as maps over the, the coefficients. And this happens whenever X is projective or has projective homology. This is not formal. And we'll see that on the, on the next slide. So that proposition is proved by using universal coefficient spectral sequences and Kuhn spectral sequences of Lewis and Mendel in the equivariant setting. And 
in order to get that these collapse, which is exactly what uh, the previous statement coincides with, the right-hand side is x to zero of a universal coefficient spectral sequence, and the left-hand side is, uh, is almost what the thing converges to. If I had instead, if this was HF2 smash x, and these were maps of HF2 modules, that, that would be the, what, what uh, the universal coefficient spectral sequence converges to. Okay. Um, but so, so in order for those to collapse, you need things to be projective as Mackie functors over M2. And being projective as M2 module does imply that, but that is specific to this thing I said earlier about isomorphism, weak equivalences being detected by isomorphisms in bigraded homotopy groups, and not, so you don't have to worry about the Mackie functor structure. So this is, yeah, motivically you can use these universal coefficient and Kuna spectral sequences of Duggar and Isaacson. And the cellularity and projectivity uh, end up giving you the splitting results that you need. Right, so the geometric condition is gonna imply that the homology of, remember we had our, our codomain, our, our domain here, that the homology of this guy is projective. And the first property of the Adams filtration implies that this is a retract of one of these guys. So we can apply the above proposition and the obstruction group just reduces to this. The naturality of the obstruction and the second property of the Adams filtration and the last part of the geometric condition, which I couldn't display, they tell you that the obstruction is zero. Um, so sorry, this is, this is just a sketch of the argument. Right, so now to the main theorem. Uh, our goal is to prove this result. And right, there's a difference. We're gonna use these attaching maps that we talked about before. And here we have just H0 and H0 plus rho H1, et cetera. And these correspond explicitly to one minus epsilon to one plus epsilon and zero respectively. So one minus epsilon is detected in the atom spectral sequence by H naught because one minus epsilon has atoms filtration one. And so it, it induces zero in homology. So you can lift it to H naught. All right, so we're gonna take our permanent cycle and we have a representing map for that permanent cycle. We're gonna apply our filtered extended power to that representing map, just like we did with DN. And we're gonna use the H infinity structure map. So here we have uh, our, our gamma tilde applied to our uh, representing map. And then the bottom map of filtrations is the H infinity structure map. So the differentials in the top row, the spectral sequence for the top row, are gonna push forward to differentials in the atom spectral sequence for Y. On the level of associated graded, this gives a map of these complexes since these are all level wise free. So this first thing, uh, sorry. So this last map is gonna give square I, the Steenrod operations on the E2 page once we take homology of this composite. And the composite is only gonna hit the operations on X because this map came from representing X by a map of filtered spectrum. And the differentials on this class here are gonna push forward to differentials on square I of X because square I of X is defined as theta applied to exactly this class. All right, so um, this goes back to this fact I mentioned before about uh, extended powers of equivariant spheres. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So this gamma two tilde of U is this filtration where um, this lower PQ just means I've quotiented out by RP upper P minus one comma Q. So there are only cells in between dimensions PQ and P plus one Q. So there's no change in this, in how many twisted cells there are. And that's exactly related to our choice 
of uh, of uh, of having a trivial action on e sigma two. One second, I have to blow my nose. Sorry about that. All right. In the motivic setting, we don't have this identification. We don't have this isomorphism, but we still understand the differentials in that spectral sequence because we were able to compute the attaching maps of extended powers using Betty realization. All right. So in the spectral sequence for gamma tilde of uh, U, we have that D1 of E sub K tensor X tensor X is given by this. And here K is P minus one, P minus I plus one. So this is gonna be the thing that, uh, so theta of E sub K tensor X tensor X is gonna hit square I minus one of X. And so, So we have these maps of filtered spectra here. This guy is just uh, what we just computed in this corollary, right? So it's a D1, so that's this one here. This 2S plus K is, well, X is infiltration S and EK is infiltration K. So we start infiltration 2S plus K and this is the total geometric dimension. So this corollary says that we have this map, okay, into our extended power of our universal example, and then we have a map all the way down to y, as we've talked about before. All right, so we have our extended power construction applied to our map that we, our, our permanent cycle. We can use the H infinity structure map to get back to the spectral sequence for y, and then we can precompose with a, a map with a universal example that we just talked about on the previous slide. Now, if we go all the way down, this is going to be like our operations, or rather, sorry, that arrow should be here, but this is going to be going all the way down from the top to the bottom is looking at power operations on, on X. So let's be a little bit more explicit. So this top row is just our universal example again. And uh, the fact that we're mapping here into S not not smashed with Y 2S plus K minus L minus one is this is what happens on the S not not factor is just the, the attaching map, this F, F I J tilde. Okay. But that map is an Adams filtration one. So we can map it into Y naught, but that actually lifts to Y minus one because it's an Adams filtration one. And now this is where we get alpha. This is where one minus epsilon gets replaced by H naught. And then we can precompose with the, with the multiplicative structure of the Adams filtration. And now we have a map from this disc over here. And this is the thing that's hitting square I minus one of X, and it maps all the way into Y 2S plus K. And the boundary of that cell maps all the way back here. And so the filtration is changed by two, so it's a D2. And this is related to that fact that the attaching map is an Adams filtration one. So that's the proof of the theorem. And some examples, some ways that you can apply this, uh, well, classically, Bruner used this, oh man. Yeah, sorry, I misread my own slide for a second. So in X, in classical X, square naught of HN is HN plus one and square one is HN squared. So classically, Bruner gets these Hopf invariant one differentials. Now they were, the differentials were known before, but it's a very self-contained proof. Um, so D2 of HN plus one is H naught HN squared. So that's D2 of square naught of HN is H naught times square one of HN. And then in the real motivic and ROC2 graded Adams spectral Wait, sequence. Sean, be yeah? before you go on, it should be said that, you know, the, the Brunner's theorem in the classical Adams spectral sequence, it gives you those Hoffman variant one differentials, but it also gives you lots of other 
differentials. Yes, yeah, sorry. It gives you lots of other it gives you lots and lots of differentials. Um, so <laughs> his his result is for more than just permanent cycles. Um, and he gives longer differentials as well. Um, yeah. And <laughs> Dan has uh and, and many other people have, have really utilized that that important work. In the uh, equivariant and the real motivic sp atom spectral sequence, we have these results, and we don't have, uh, and, the, and the differentials are zero, and these are sort of X computations that Dan Isaacson has, has mentioned, or that I asked Dan Isaacson about. And we, so D2 of H4 is, is non-zero, and so we can't continue this because our result only applies to permanent cycles. I wanna mention one thing about these, is that this last one, this D2 of H4 in the equivariant atom spectral sequence follows from D2 of H4 in the motivic atom spectral sequence because we have better control of X in the motivic setting. However, that theorem in the motivic setting only follows once we know it equivariantly using Betty realization. So that's kind of interesting, I think. Um, so yeah, that's where I wanted to stop, but I think. I went a little fast, so if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. There's no debug okay. card for the old. Yeah. Sorry, hang on a second. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, many of us are muted. Where's uh, Sean? I've lost you here on my list. We should unmute you. Okay. All right. So questions for Sean. Well, I, I have a question. So what is the status of this, <coughs> you know, result for things that aren't permanent cycles? Is it like, have you not proved it because it's not true or because it's just more work and you haven't done it or you're working on it and it's, you know, not yet written down? Um, it's, it's, it's on the list of, of things to work on. Um, I, that, that H infinity ring spectra volume is, is kind of a beast and the part where um, Bob does that is, is pretty intense and, uh, yeah. So I, I I don't think it's I don't I don't expect it to be false. Um, but it's but just I, like the, the technical details are just sort of like just extensive. Yeah. Okay. Or at least that's my impression of it currently. Maybe someone will have a better or clever tool right. or idea. Right. Because it would be great to be able to extend that to the H five. Right. Because. Yeah something new happens there, but anyway. Yeah, so what, one thing I will say that is a serious technical difficulty is, so, so we have a formula for D2, and it happens to be T2 because the coefficients are in Adams filtration one. And you might try and do things uh, like D3s, you might try and investigate. One serious difficulty for this is this involves understanding the attaching maps in these equivariant truncated projective spaces, but you lose control pretty quickly uh, of these things when you work with the model for E sigma two that I do. And, and the reason is that you don't, so frequently for projective spaces, you can understand the attaching maps by looking at Steenrod operations. And, what the Steenrod operations hit because they increased the weight is sort of has a lot of possible row and tau divisibility. And so I don't think we know what these attaching maps are as well as we would in, in the classical case. In the motivic setting, this is also a problem because you no longer have that Betty realization induces an isomorphism in stable stems. And that's something that we really relied on. Um, so even if you were to do this for uh, 
if you were trying to push this further, you can push it further, I think, in terms of talking about non-permanent cycles, but I don't know how easy it would be to push it further in terms of talking about like D3 and D4, like Bob was able to do classically. But I mean, hopefully someone who's listening has a better idea about how to understand uh, these equivariant truncated projective spaces and their cohomology. Right. Okay, other questions? Okay, if not, I'm gonna unmute everyone one more time. So thanks, Sean. Thanks very much again. And our next meeting is in two weeks.